Pleasure you could stay with us. I am Pius Kujubaka to our very first story. The Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry has resolved to petition Parliament's Select Committee on Mines and Energy over the increase in utility tariffs by the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission. According to the Chamber, the decision follows several appeals to the PURC to review the tariffs for large-scale businesses since the current economic crisis is already biting hard on the operations, thereby forcing most of them look elsewhere for cheaper tariffs, which, um, while others, also fold up. Now, President of the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Clement Seyamwaku, says they will continue to push for a downward review for their members. The Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry's concerns follow a similar plea by the Association of Ghana Industries to the PURC to consider reviewing the tariffs for industries. The Chamber argues that the current economic crisis is pushing most of their members out of business. They contend, though utility companies need to recover costs to sustain their operations, the effect of the utility tariff increase could be dire for both industry and the utility companies. Speaking to Joy Business after an engagement with the PURC, President of the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Clement Seamwaku, said they will lobby Parliament to help adjust the tariffs for large-scale businesses. Laws are made by men. If it's gazetted, this is not the first time that um, prices have gone up, that it, it has not come down. We always make um, our voice known to them, and sometimes they look at the window and they adhere to that. Since government is the main stakeholder with these uh, utility companies, there's a way out that we can forge ahead and get it done. They will have to look at it. If it has to go back to Parliament for them to look at it, we'll do that. We'll lobby with the Parliamentary Select Committee and all those that matters to make sure that we will not keep to the price. But in a sharp response, Executive Secretary of the PURC, Dr. Ishmalaka, said nothing can be done about it for now since the tariffs have been gazetted to take effect from February. This adjustment, uh, the decision has been made and it has been gazetted. Uh, it's a law. So for now, uh, nothing can be done on the part of PURC. However, there will be other quarterly adjustments. So we, what we are doing is to establish the protocols for engagement to see that uh, we take, and let me also add that even before we engage the chamber, uh, PURC on its own, had uh, made putting measures uh, to protect industry. One of them was that we have been able to reverse the structure for the first time for SMEs to pay lower than those in the residential sector. Within a period of less than six months, electricity tariffs have shot up significantly on two occasions, 26.6% in September 2022 and 29.9% for this quarter, totaling 56.5%. And it is important we have to engage the chamber further on this developing story. Joining us via Zoom is the CEO of the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Mark Bedou Abouadje. For more, grateful Mark, you could join us on the marketplace. Yesterday, you did meet the PURC. You tabled your concerns to them. Why would you want to lobby Parliament when the tariffs have been gazetted to take effect from um, February? Well, we, we, our initial position was to first engage the PURC because they actually are the regulators and they announce the, the increments. We thought that uh, the first place uh, is to start with PUIC and look at the way forward, which we did yesterday. But from the information we got from PUIC, it looks a bit difficult for them, since according to them, they have gazetted the, uh, the increment. We have issue with the gazetting because the time of the announcement and the gazetting is, is just too short. So you announce and you know definitely that people will come and engage you because businesses have a lot of concerns anytime there's an increment uh, in electricity and water. And immediately you gazette and you are telling us that you can't do anything about it. Then there, there's a challenge because consultation was poor. Nobody consulted the, the biggest uh, business association in Canada, the Canada National Board of Commerce and Industry for our input into the increment and the announcement was, was made. And later they are telling us that nothing can be done. So we felt that there are other major stakeholders that we can consult uh, to ensure that we don't get a reversal or a reduction in uh, the electricity rate and that of, that of water. So we are escalating the discussion, as we said earlier, 
to Parliament. So we have had initial discussion with the Parliamentary Select Committee on Trade and Industry and that of Mines and Energy as well. There are also discussions to also contact uh, the Office of the President to see what can be done about this increment. The effects of this increment on businesses for me will be catastrophic. And we have to quickly look at it so that we don't create the problem that will be difficult for us uh, to resolve. Mark, clarify this for me. Are you saying that you weren't consulted before this uh, latest increment you know, took effect? And what has been the norm? Well, we, we were not consulted. And we made it clear to uh, the period when, when we met them. Mm. And that, that has been the situation for quite some time now. And we have made several appeals to them. That is important that you consult the chamber, you consult the private sector. Because beside the uh, uh, household consumption, the largest uh, entity that consumes electricity and water is uh, the businesses. Mm. So anytime we want to increase electricity, the rate for electricity and um, water, it is just fair that you consult the key stakeholders, and that is the private sector. And what was, not consulted. what was the reason was why the they, what was the reason why they didn't consult you? Well, if you heard the executive secretary yesterday, he said mm. they are now putting in place measures to do extensive consultation. The another argument is that they do consultation only for the the major uh, tariff review, which was done in September, and because this one is just a minor and just a quarterly thing, they do less of consultation because it's assumed that we know this will come. But definitely we don't know how these things are affiliated. We don't we are not too sure of the uh, indicators that goes into the calculation. And from last year we have made our budget with a certain level of increment in electricity and water. And now if you increase it by this magnitude, of which in fact this one is supposed to be the minor review. But if you look at the figures, the minor review is even greater than the major review that was done in, in, in September, mm. because this review, electricity is about almost 30 percent, and that of September was 27 percent. So why would a minor review even be greater than that of a major major review? So they shouldn't consult only for the major review. They should also consult for the for the minor review as well, since the increment is also that significant and to negatively impact on businesses. But they have assured us that going forward, they will consult. But now that they have not, and we have made our position to them, I think we will go a step further to look at the other stakeholders to ensure that we get some relief for businesses. I don't know how much you're looking at by way of rate of decrease in terms of the increments. And how optimistic are you that the Parliament Select Committee, you intend you know, petitioning to look into this matter, will yield a positive result? Well, I... They know what is going on. We have had discussion on defense issues and had results from them. We are hopeful that they will be open to discuss the issue with us because the impact, as I said earlier, on, mm. will even affect the parliamentarians themselves and, and all of us. So we are hoping. Their doors are always open and they are always um, ready to engage with us in the interests of the private sector and the interests of Ghana. So I, I hope that after our discussion, in fact, we are sending the petition. Uh, uh, the next, next one hour, because we had a meeting with you guys this morning, we put together the petition and we are sending it to uh, the Parliament Select Committee on Trade and Industry and that of Mines and Energy, and also a copy to the presidency as well. We will continue to engage, we will continue to push until we get a result for businesses and for members of the chamber. And what becomes your next line of action if um, the petition you, you intend giving to the various um, agencies and of course the presidency for that matter fails? Well, as I said, let's, let's look at that, uh, the next step. And we, we, are, we are very, very very optimistic that we are going to get results. When we get there and we realize that nothing can be done, I think the next line of action will also be communicated to, to you as well. But we are very optimistic that we we'll get results from this uh, situation. All right, Mark, before I let you go, um, Monday, the Bank of Ghana will be announcing the policy rate. And I know it is a key thing you guys look out for. Now, what are your expectations ahead of the announcement? My expectation is that at least, the least they can do for us is to maintain the rate at 27% as it is now. Any further increments, my brother, is 
is going to negatively impact on activities of the private sector. The reasons why consistently they've been increasing the policy rate, which has been that inflation is going up, the mm. city is depreciating. We have done that since the beginning of 2022, increasing the policy rate up to this current level, and still inflation is going up, still the city is depreciating. The, the kind of inflation we have now is not an inflation that can be resolved using an increment in policy rate. We are rather compounding the situation, but the cost of production will go up. Any increment will cause an increase in the lending rate, and businesses whenever there's an increment, we'll find a way and push part of this increment into consumers. In fact, a lot of businesses have gotten to a level where they cannot increase prices, but they are at the peak of increasing prices, and they are not competitive now as compared to products from the foreign uh, market. So businesses, by and large, are absorbing this high cost. And to get to a time where most of them cannot contain the, the cost and they have to fold up, and we have had a lot of them uh, uh, folding up a lot of them and laying off people. The 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 problem we have now would necess not necessarily be resolved by just going to IMF. The problem is to ensure that we support and boost the production of the private sector in Ghana. And a high interest rate will not support that agenda. So we are pleading with the central bank, with the governor that they should look at the potential impact of an increment in policy rate on business. In fact, the rate we have now, the 20, 27%, is about the second highest we have had in our, in our economy. The highest is 27.5. Mm. So we are just short by just 0 0.5. Any increment means that we're going to have the highest policy rate in our economy. And our policy rate and lending rate, let me see, responds positively to increase in policy rate. Anytime the policy rate goes up, the banks are also businesses and they will respond appropriately by increasing the lending rate. Lending rate now is between 35 and 40. And sometimes I wonder what we are doing to the private sector. If a business person is borrowing at 40%, now you are also adding electricity, you are also adding labor costs and all those things. At the end, the businesses cannot make profit and mm -hmm. they will collapse. And that's relocating to other countries. In the sub region, our policy rate is the highest. Our interest rate is the highest. And we are saying that we are going to increase policy rate again, which will translate into an increment in lending rate. What we are saying is that businesses will collapse. And when they collapse, people will be laid off. If you have a government that is clearly saying that for 2023, they are not going to employ even one person. The only hope for those who are looking for jobs, for those who will be completing university, and for those who are already in the labor market, is for the private sector to expand and to absorb them. If you make it difficult for the private sector to, to expand, then a lot of people are going to be unemployed, and they have social and political impact on our economy. So we are hoping that the policy rate will not go up and probably will come down to give some relief to businesses. Mm. Mark, we are indeed grateful for your time here on the marketplace for your perspective this hour. Ghana's international creditors have started pushing for more details about the composition of Ghana's debts. This is the latest request from the Paris Club following the government's request for reprofiling of the country's debts and possible cancellation. George Yafe has the rest of the story. The request is coming from the creditors' committee that has been formed by the Paris Club to look into Ghana's application, the committee wants to get fine details about which countries Ghana is indebted and the terms of the loans. This would help to better reconcile the numbers for any action going forward. The development may help in understanding the true position of Ghana's indebtedness to the group of 20 developed countries members. There is the framework that has been established with the full support coming from the IMF for countries that have requested for debt cancellation. It is believed that if government is able to deal with this challenge, then maybe the February ending target set by the finance minister, Ken Ofriata, to reach a deal with the Paris Club in terms of their commitment to cancel Ghana's debt may come to pass. Getting this deal may also help Ghana in securing the IMF board approval for the country's program to turn around the economy. 
You're still watching the marketplace with me, Pius Kojubaka. Customers of the Kaswa based Utrak Savings and Loans this morning besieged the bank's premises to withdraw their savings. According to the angry customers, the financial institution has remained closed for the past two months and efforts to get the bank officials to heed to their concerns have proved unsuccessful. Some of them said they have deposited amounts ranging from 200 cities to 20 cities. My money is over 16,000 cities and my daughter's 3,000 cities. So it is more than 200,000 Ghana cities. I'm taking my money. They should give me my money, else I'll look for any means to take my money. They should bring my money. I was saving it. My child has finished school. I was going to use the money to pay fees, and now the money is locked up. Time is up, and I haven't received any money to pay. I am a single parent, and I have four children. I have been selling someone else's bread to make some money for my children. I came to save my money with them, and they didn't say anything, and they left. They should give me my money. My contribution is 6,000 Ghana cities, and my sister's is 2,000 Ghana cities. So we beg them. We have suffered to save that money, so we are pleading to them to have mercy and pay us our money. Let's now talk some tech news. And Microsoft company said it plans to eliminate 10,000 jobs in response to the global economic slowdown, the company's largest layoffs in more than eight years, and the latest in a string of cuts from big technology companies. Now, the software company's chief executive, Satya Nadala, wrote that the layoffs would happen before the end of March and efforts or effect less than 5% of the company's worldwide workforce. Joining me for better appreciation of this is Henry Kobler, lead of uh, ISOLV Africa. Henry, grateful you could join us on the marketplace. Um, I'm pretty sure you've you've, you know what is happening in this terrain. What's your own view on this? Okay, thank you very much. So, generally with the layoffs that are happening, I think that has actually started since last year, where we've seen major layoffs. I mean, uh, by from 2018 coming through, we've actually seen some level of layoffs. Uh, um, I think that after the COVID, a lot of the tech companies had focused on bringing in a lot of hands because there was sort of um, a lot of demand on tech products. And so a lot of the companies had brought in a lot of experts to take care of certain parts. Um, but generally, we've seen that um, it's really not the case where a lot of the patronage on some of these tech companies are actually going low. And so a lot of companies are sort of looking forward to laying off, uh, which is not a surprise when it comes out to the tech industry where we're actually also starting to appreciate where people or where some of these tech companies bigger tech companies are bringing in um, some of these ai tools and all of that to sort of take care of most of the um, jobs that have to be done by humans in these institutions and so a lot of the cost a lot of the economic meltdown sort of also affecting some of these tech companies and so it's sort of not a surprise seeing some of these layoffs i mean we're also going to start and my prediction, some of these layoffs are actually hitting Ghanaian tech companies as well. Mm. And can you tell us more about the open um, artificial intelligence and why Microsoft is investing that huge in, in that setup? So it's, um, Microsoft has actually been looking forward to getting into um, a company that could sort of have that impact. I mean, we've seen the likes of Google take over anything when it comes out to search and uh, being on the internet. And so Microsoft had actually been looking forward to getting into a, a, a tech company that could give us that. I mean, the same as we, we've also seen with um, someone like Elon Musk looking forward to tech mm. uh, tools that, that are there. And so Elon actually had already been a huge investor into OpenAI, but sort of had to step down because of conflict of interest, yes. which is generally what he had thought that uh, would happen. And so Microsoft had already invested, I mean, mm -hmm in that company and now it's also investing hugely in, in OpenAI because of the usage of um, the language models. Now it, OpenAI basically has a, a product called ChatGPT uh, which is taking the world by storm. Now that application is a full AI application that is helping 
a lot of people to do, I mean, very uncomfortable or, or unimaginable things. And so the same application could even write examinations for people. This uh, AI, I mean, that's so much that it, it comparably has a lot of the intelligence like a human uh, intelligence because it's been fed with quite a lot of uh, data that it could do similar things uh, just like human. The only unfortunate thing about it currently is that it's not an online application and so could not do searches like Google. But at the application release, I mean, just within five days, it had over a million user, mm. user base. And that's really unprecedented. And so mm. now as we're speaking now, they are down because um, there's, there's so much when it gets down to building that facility. And so Microsoft's funding into such a company relatively is going to give it a very good boost in terms of how they're going to operationalize and get into um, people using their, their application. But for me, it's, um, it's more of a threat, but also a blessing in the tech industry because um, AI tools, as I predicted, are also going to start doing things as humans would do. Uh, so there has to be now a lot of diversity when it comes out to tech tools. Now, um, Henry, I got to ask you this. Many have said that the tech jobs are the safest space yet. This is happening. How is this tech going to impact on humans? I, I'm pretty sure that when you had, if, if any of the, the, the YouTube influencers, right, mm -hmm. had told their mothers that they would be, you, they would be on YouTube when, when they were asked what they were going to do uh, for future, I'm sure a lot of people would have not been happy about that response. But today, people are actually making a lot of money from being Twitter influencers, YouTube influencers, content creators for TikTok and all that. I mean, generally, tech is, is, is one part where you always get to be adaptive. At a time where you're having a lot of AI tools coming in, there are people that are building these tools to sort of have some level of life. And so there are always going to be that diversity in terms of jobs that are going to be available. And so it's not really about being safe. It's more about being adaptive. It's more being about futuristic, being able to understand the trends of, of, of things and then being able to sort of connect to those trends and uh, move on, on with the flow. Generally, that's how it's going to be. Uh, we might not necessarily have a clear picture when it comes down to anything tech, because tech really changes. It precedes mm. a lot of regulations. But generally, it's also safe being in that side. All right. Thank you very much, Henry Kobla, for your time here on The Marketplace, helping us appreciate the latest uh, news in the world of technology. And that's it for The Marketplace for today. I am Pius Kujobaka. Always a pleasure serving you. For more news, you can log on to myjoyonline.com forward slash business. Great stories on that portal for you. Do enjoy the rest of our programs.